In this segment, we're going to talk about building a transition-based dependency parser. So we could try to build our dependency parsers in the same, same style as our constituency parser using uh, something like CKY. Um, so there are chart parsing algorithms, dynamic programs for doing inference uh, in dependency spaces. Um, the time ends up being the same uh, cubic time in the length of the sentence. Uh, the algorithm actually ends up being quite a bit trickier than the basic CKY that we saw. So the, but, but instead we're going to talk about a different style of parser just to give you a sense of the space of uh, kind of algorithms that people use in this space. Uh, and this is going to be transition-based or, or shift-reduced. That's another term for it. Uh, and this is more similar to the kinds of parsing that get used for compilers. So um, when doing compilation of uh, programming languages, we don't have ambiguity in the same way that we have in natural language. And so we can kind of just go through it and make decisions greedily as we go and not have to worry about, oh, I shouldn't have attached this prepositional phrase here because actually this other information later in the sentence leads me to think that I should have interpreted it this way. So the way these work is that a tree is built from a sequence of incremental decisions moving left to right through the sentence. And we have two data structures. We have a stack, which contains the partially built tree, and a buffer, which contains the rest of the sentence. So how does this work? So we are going to start off with an initial state where the stack just contains a single root symbol, and the buffer contains all of the words in our sentence here. And our running example is going to be, I ate some spaghetti bolognese. Uh, and so probably the only kind of unique thing about this example is that uh, spaghetti is actually the head of the noun phrase here. Typically, the heads of noun phrases come at the end, um, but here spaghetti bolognese uh, is a kind of borrowed term from Italian, and so, uh, you know, it, it retains the Italian word ordering. All right, so uh, the first thing that we do is have what's called a shift operation. And we always have to start with the shift, because what the shift does is it moves items from the top of the buffer and puts them on top of the stack. Um, so after one shift operation, it looks like this. And after another shift operation, it looks like this. So the, the kind of operations that we have then uh, involve combining items on the stack in order to produce a tree. So the operation that we use in this case is going to be called a left arc. And the way to think about this is, OK, well, at the end of the day, we need 8 to be the parent of i. And so what we need to do is we need to apply this operation here in order to build the correct tree. So uh, we're, we use this notation here where sigma denotes uh, the stack. And then sigma bar w minus 1 means that the stack has w minus 1 as its last uh, symbol. And so what we do is we uh, transform the stack with w minus 2, w minus 1 as the last two items in it. And we put an arc between them, and then we kind of put them back on the stack with w minus 1 uh, now being a new element of the stack. And so that gives us a state that looks like this. So the stack technically only contains root and 8, but I'm drawing this arrow here to i to indicate that you know, we've also added this arc in here. So you know, we can kind of think of that arc as being part of the data structure as well. So this is a way of uh, building up this tree that we see above. Now, what we're doing right now is we're doing a quote unquote oracle derivation. We are talking about what are the correct operations to do at each step. Our transition system is going to generally allow us to do all kinds of crazy stuff, build all sorts of trees that we don't want here. Um, but what we're doing is just a walkthrough of how we get the correct tree in this case, and then we'll revisit the idea of how to get the tree that we actually want. Okay, so. The system that we're using is called the ARC standard transition system. Uh, and th it, this features three operations, two of which we've seen so far. Shift, left arc, and then right arc, which is the same as left arc. You take two things off the stack, but now you add an arc going the other way, uh, and then you add w minus 2 
back to the stack. And the end state is going to be when the stack just contains root and the buffer is empty. And you might say, okay, where did all the words go? All the words are now children of root. I'm just not showing them here. So as a good little thought exercise, we can ask how many transitions do we need if we have n words in a sentence? So you should think about this and try to come up with an answer. And based on the operations that we have here, you should be able to convince yourself that we need two n operations because we need n shifts in order to get all the words from the buffer onto the stack, and then n reduces in order to get all of the arcs that we need to actually build the tree. So there, there are other systems other than arc standard. There's, they they you, you know, typically use operations that look like these, but they might directly pull things off of the top of the buffer, um, or they might be a little bit more flexible. Um, we're not going to discuss them here. Um, the kind of basic ideas are the same in all cases. So the idea is that we want to use these operations in order to build up the tree that we've got here. So again, this is what we call an oracle derivation. This is how we construct the gold tree um, and what we hope to be able to reproduce when we actually uh, build a parser that runs at test time. So we saw these operations already. We shift, shift, left arc, and we end up in this state. And one thing I'll note is that we actually didn't have to do the left arc now. We could have waited and done a whole bunch of other stuff and then come back and done it at the very end. Um, but typically the uh, sort of decision that you make when designing these systems is you want to do the left arcs as soon as possible. And so we decide to do it at this point in the sequence. All right. If we put in a right arc now, that would actually be a correct arc from the standpoint of the parser. We would get an 8 being the child of root. That's correct. But we cannot do that right now, because if we did, we would not be able to attach more children to 8. And 8 still needs this whole spaghetti bolognese thing as its child. And so we need to hold off on doing this particular reduce operation. Uh, and in general, we can't do, we can't combine something with root until the very end, because otherwise, you know, you'd have to stick a second child under root in order to actually deal with the rest of the sentence. Okay, so what happens next? Well, we need to shift two more words, um, and then we left arc again. And so we get spaghetti as the parent of sum, um, and this sort of follows what we've seen already. All right, and then we do a last shift operation to get bolognese onto the buffer. All right, so this is kind of characteristic of how this parser execution looks. We have a bunch of partially built structures, and then we're kind of waiting to do right arcs, uh, you know, sort of go all the way with right arcs, essentially. Um, and so then we do a whole bunch of right arc operations to kind of combine these things, um, and we end up with our final state here. Okay, so what we need to do when we actually build one of these parsers, so we need to make the correct decision at each step. And so we can go through the steps of this process and ask ourselves, how do we make the right decision here? Okay, so in this case, it's actually very easy. There's only one legal move, which is shift. So we're going to look at a more complicated state where we actually could do several different things. We could shift, we could left arc, we could right arc. Um, all three actions are legal, but we need a way to figure out what to do. And so we frame this as a multi-way classification problem of which action do we take. Um, and we can do that with something like a linear classifier, where we have our three actions, and this is our different features view of uh, classification, where we extract features based on the stack, the buffer, and the action, uh, and then we take a dot product with weights. So what are the features to actually tell us that this should be a left arc here? So this is a pretty tricky uh, feature design problem. Um, you know, in particular, deciding whether to left arc versus shift, you know, we, like we said, there's actually kind of ambiguity in how you even define the transition system to do that. 
But assuming we, we know we want to do left arcs as soon as possible, the question sort of boils down to why is it okay to do a left arc here? And really the, um, the, the kind of characteristic thing to look at here is what's going on on the stack. And we can look at the part of speech tag sequence, which I'm not showing here, but is generally information you could have available if you ran a tagger in advance. We look at the stack tag sequences, and this sequence is pretty informative because when we have a determiner before a noun, a lot of times that, uh, you know, that's going to be the direct object, uh, and then that determiner is going to be a child of the noun. Now, this isn't always the case. For example, if we had the art museum here, we would not want to do a left arc yet. We would want to merge museum, uh, and then we would need both the and art to be children of museum. So we also need to be looking at the buffer as well. So uh, in particular, we actually, in this case, need to look at the words in the buffer, for example, the word bolognese, to know that we shouldn't merge that yet. Uh, sorry, should we, sh we shouldn't shift it yet onto the stack that we should do this left arc first. Um, but representing these dependencies is very complicated. We need to look at kind of a bunch of pieces of information at the same time and kind of balance them. This is much trickier than kind of thinking about what's going on in our grammar uh, for constituency parsing, which was a much more straightforward kind of way of thinking about things. So we're going to come back to this feature design problem and look at some neural net methods for this task. And that was actually one of the, this was one of the first places where neural nets really sort of took off in NLP, just because designing the features for this task is so challenging. All right. So typically the way that these models work is we make our decisions and uh, we need to train that somehow. So we turn a tree into a decision sequence using what's called an oracle. So that's basically the process that we went through earlier where we had the gold tree there and we said, what is the sequence of operations that gives rise to this tree? All right, and then we uh, train a classifier to predict the right decision using this as the training data. And then sometimes you might use something like beam search we're not really going to talk about that here. Instead, you know, just imagine that we run this model as a greedy, uh, greedily. We say, all right, in this state, what's the next action to take? OK, shift, great, let's do it. And then we ask ourselves what the decision is in the next state. So you can definitely make mistakes and wind up in places that you don't want to be. And then it's, you know, well, it's, it's impossible usually to get the, back to the correct tree from there. Um, but sometimes it's even tricky to make the right decisions going forward. So in particular, the training data that we've talked about so far, it assumes that you made the correct decisions up to this point, right? If we just take uh, our oracle and we kind of follow along and train to predict the correct thing at each step, uh, we've only actually seen cases where we've always made the correct decisions up till now. So uh, from a kind of state space perspective, I'm going to draw a picture that looks like this where we have some path through the state space from the start state to the gold end state with the correct tree. And what we're doing is we're basically considering each of these choices in a dotted box. Like, do we take the correct decision or do we take a wrong decision here? And we train the model to take the correct decision. So each tree gives us two end training examples. But the kind of thing that should worry us a little bit is that we actually never observe what we call non-gold states here. Um, we never think about, let's say, what happens if we made some bad decisions and then want to correct them and kind of, you know, at least make the correct decisions about the other arcs in this tree. We just never even see that data during training time. So this is a problem called exposure bias. Uh, one thing we can do is we can formulate this as reinforcement learning and think about this as exploring a state space with actions and getting some reward based on how good our tree is. We actually don't need to do something that complicated, though, because normally at any point in the space, we can say always what the correct decision is. There's none of this kind of delayed reward uncertainty that shows up in reinforcement learning. Um, 
But there's lots of techniques for thinking about, okay, how do we sample kind of trajectories that are off this gold path and then train with awareness of those, et cetera. So building these parsers, while it's sort of appealing in the sense that all we're doing is putting together a classifier, which is a lot simpler than, um, you know, PCFGs and CKY and things like that. Um, while it's, it's simple, there's a lot of kind of tricky decisions to make in how we actually train it. So this gives you a sense of how transition-based parsers work structurally, what these transition systems look like, um, and some of the kind of considerations that go into building and training them. So we'll talk about what real-world transition-based systems look like, but uh, that's the end of this segment for now.